coming up on Theater Talk. I remember opening night of Virginia Woolf, we had a party at our apartment on 10th Street, and Abe Burroughs said to Edward in his own home, welcome to the American theater, young man. <laughs> and I thought, where the hell do you think he's been the past five years? Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, uh, we lost one of the great American playwrights this year, Edward Albee, whose plays include, of course, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, The Zoo Story, A Delicate Balance, Three Tall Women, The Goat, or Who is Sylvia? He was uh, kind of a friend of mine. I admired him tremendously, one of the great, great writers of American literature, and we want to talk about Edward Albee tonight with three people who are very close to him. So welcome to Theater Talk. Uh, Jacob Holder, who is the executive director of the Edward Albee Foundation, is very close to Edward uh, at the end of his life. Welcome, Jacob. One of the great American stage actresses, Mercedes Rule, who starred in The Goat, or Who is Sylvia, and The Occupant, and uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and very close to Edward as well and perhaps one of his oldest friends in the world, a celebrated American playwright himself, Terrence McNally. Welcome to uh, Theater Talk. Nice to be Thanks. here. Thanks. So, Terrence, can you take us back to the, uh, the first meeting, the first memory you have of meeting Edward Albee? It was before he became Edward Albee. No, he wasn't Edward Albee when I met him. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't Terrence McNally. I was a, <laughs> I was a student at Columbia, yeah. and at a party I met him. And... Uh, <clears throat> We got to talking, and Zoo Story had just opened. Mm. So when he said who he was, I, oh, that's that play I just read a pretty good review for. Mm. I thought it was a great review then. I went back and read the original. Uh -huh. I would say it was mixed. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a rave for the Beckett, uh, Crap's Last Tape. Right, because they were on the double yeah, bill. Of yeah, it. but at any rate, at the end of the, uh, you know, the evening was sort of winding down, and he said, where do you live? I said, in the village. He says, oh, so do I, do you want to share a cab? And he lived several blocks north of me. And he said, um, you want to come up for a drink? And I remember distinctly saying, your wife won't mind. <laughs> and that's the first time I tried to throw back his head and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> was he intimidating then as a, as a young man, as no. he could be later? No, he wasn't. No, no he wasn't intimidating at all. Mm. No. Uh, I don't know where the intimidation came from. Uh, his mother I did meet, she was pretty intimidating. Oh. He didn't become his mother, but... Oh, right. Well, tell us about but, that, because Three Tall Women was based on his yeah, mother, and yeah. he was estranged from her, mm -hmm. and she, but she was an intimidating, scary sort of figure. Yeah, and of course you were so predisposed against her after Edward had spoken <laughs> so poorly of her all those years. But when Edward got formidable, I don't know when it happened, uh, but it happened. I think it was a kind of self-protection. Perhaps because overnight he became one of the most famous writers mm -hmm. in, in America. Yes, and... Um, with Virginia Woolf, I mean, even then, there's a big difference between Off-Broadway and Broadway. Yeah. And it was, he'd done four evenings of wonderful one-act plays Off-Broadway, but still the, was, let's see what he can do on Broadway with a full-length play. And I remember opening night of Virginia Woolf, we had a party at our apartment on 10th Street, and Abe Burroughs said to Edward in his own home, welcome to the American theater, young man. <laughs> And I thought, where the hell do you think he's been the past five years? <laughs> Writing some terrific plays. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, they didn't, was, that crowd didn't get south of 42nd Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Edwards, so what happened to Edward really happened with Virginia Woolf, though to yeah. more theatrically inclined. It had begun at the uh, Provincetown Playhouse. Right. Mercedes, when you uh, first met Edward, he was the formidable Edward Albee. Yes. Was he intimidating to be around as an, as an actor? Yes, I was uh, first introduced to him at uh, his Christmas party by Irene Worth. She took me as her date, and I tried to be a fascinator. <laughs> and that was a big mistake because I was taken down like that. Um, and when we got back in the elevator, uh, I said, Irene, well, I said, he was rather rude, wasn't he? And Irene just looked at me and laughed. <laughs> so then I met him uh, a few years later when I read, uh, I auditioned for the play about the baby. 
Right. And once again, I tried to be uh, memorably brilliant, and he just took me down like that. <laughs> when you say he took you down, what well, he just has a few dry words that just put you in your place. He would do that if he felt that was what the moment needed, and apparently I presented him with a number of moments that needed it. <laughs> and after that audition, I just remember going down to the street and standing there in the lobby and just breaking out in tears because I just had so much, adored him since college, you know. But the time that I really met him was um, after the dress rehearsal, which was the only show he could get to, of uh, Virginia Woolf at the Guthrie Theater, right. uh, where uh, uh, Patrick Stewart and I were doing the play. And I was terrified. I, I didn't think I even knew, knew all the lines at this point, first audience. And um, we were down in the basement. There were dressing rooms in the basement. There was a knock at my door. And I opened it up, and I certainly was not expecting to open it up on Edward Albee, but there he was. And he just put his arms out, and I just went into his arms, and he, he, he didn't just do a per, you know, peremptory hug. It was a good hug. He was very, very encouraging. He was a different man, and he, and he just said, remember one thing, just one note. She loved her father. Mm. Martha in the play. Yeah. So passionately. And I thought, okay, note taken. So that was the first real meeting. That's when we met heart to heart. How did you come into Edward's life? Uh, I'd been living in Alaska for a few years, going to a community college there, and <clears throat> moved to Bellingham, Washington, where I wanted to get into the creative writing program. So, I don't know, I was about um, 20 years old. But I, I wound up falling in love with um, playwriting within the first couple of months of trying. I flew back to Alaska at the end of that uh, semester, and I had the idea for a play in my mind, and I started to realize that I had this, this terrible urge on the plane to write this thing, and I'm scribbling away uh, on napkins. And by the time I had landed in Alaska, I had this finished play. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when, I was, when I was back in Bellingham, I had gone into a coffee shop, and the barista says, I've heard you started to write plays. I said, sure. He said, well, you must know who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. And I had no idea what he was talking about. I said, all right, get out of here and go to the, the used bookstore and pick up a copy of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf by Edward Albee and don't come back in here until you've read it. This being college, I did it right then and there. Came back after reading it shaking. Mm -hmm. So now I'm back you know, in Alaska and I'm working at a music store, manager of a music store to make up money for school. And the local, theater, the local high school theater teacher came in and said, I heard that you've been writing plays. I said, uh, yeah. He goes, well, take a look at this. And he's, he holds out a flyer for a theater conference in Valdez, Alaska. And then I saw featuring Edward Albee. And I froze on that. I said, all right, I've, I've got to try for this thing. I sent in uh, this play that I'd just written on the airplane. And I got a call that said, we'd love to have a reading of your play. And I went out to Valdez, and I won an award for this play. And Edward was there. And the most I was able to do was go up to him and thank him for an opportunity like this, but I was too intimidated to say anything beyond that. Two years later, I went back to the same theater conference with another play, and I won another award for that play. And he came to my reading. The reason he came to my reading, by the way, was Marion Seldes was there. Ah! I said. And she held a workshop that was scheduled right against my reading. Into the and I was devastated <laughs> because I said if I wasn't the playwright, I would be in Marion Seldes' acting workshop just listening to her speak. Uh, so I went up to him and I said, listen, would you please come to my reading? I don't think anybody's going to be there. And he said, all right, if, you know, I'll, I'll come to your reading. And if, if you only hold it for me, then you know, hopefully you'll consider it worth your while. So he showed up and the night of the gala, after the awards ceremony, I've got the adrenaline pumping, you know, Maybe I should stick with this playwriting thing. He comes up and he says to me, you, come here before I never see you again. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful play. I'm sorry, by the way, I do this thing. I cannot help but actually imitate Edward when I speak his words. <laughs> 15 years of association. <laughs> you should come take my classes in Houston, Texas. And I was, I was kind of surprised that he was teaching in Houston, Texas. And I remember... The wilderness years. The, yeah. And I said, well, I'm waiting to hear back from Juilliard, but if I don't get into Juilliard, I will definitely come to take your uh, classes. He was a little insulted by that. <laughs> he said to me, well, when they, when they don't accept you, you'll, you'll have a place with me in Houston. And you end, is that what happened? Oh yeah. Um, Terrence, I want to ask you, can you take us back to those 
early days in the in the village when it was a place where struggling artists could live as opposed to the Beverly Hills it is now. Mm -hmm. Was it an, an exciting artistic time for all of you people at the beginning of careers? Yes. Uh, number one, we lived there because of the rents. Uh, exactly. I lived on Perry Street in a one-bedroom apartment for $45 oh. a month. <laughs> it was a cheap neighborhood. There exactly. were tenements yeah. and uh, there were painters, there were musicians, and uh, they hung out certain bars with the musicians, the poets. The only time Samuel Beckett ever came to New York, he was at the uh, San Ran I, I, I've forgotten the name of the, the literary bar. <laughs> I remember Edward and I looking at Samuel Beckett and, <laughs> like, oh, there's Sam Beckett. And then Alan Schneider eventually introduced them. The director, yeah. Yeah, but it was a very exciting time. And uh, playwriting was sexy, hot. I mean, people who really cared about theater mm -hmm. went off Broadway, I'd say, at least once a week. Was Edward, he was never in the closet. Was he always open about his sexuality, in a, even though you really couldn't be at the time? That with the whole the whole gay world he lived well, in was was it in the closet? I say Edward ever lived in a gay world. No, no, he no. Yeah, uh, we have different opinions about Edward and his outness. I would say. Um, oh well, what would, what would your opinion be about that? Well, I I think Edward came out sort of by default when he was a senior citizen. Uh, mm. He was not part, in my mind, of uh, you know Edward and I. There was a period where we were not great friends after a very passionate affair that lasted. Five years, we had a very passionate breakup. Mm. So there was periods when we were out of touch, and I was part of the gay community, critical of Edward for being so indifferent to what we saw as a struggle for acceptance rights. Why do you think he was indifferent to that? Not indifferent. I think just I think Edward was terrified of being identified because the press loved the phrase "gay playwright." And Edward, if you wrote anything with a gay character you would be a gay playwright, and Edward did not want to be. And I agree with Edward, people are playwrights yeah. who choose to write about the black experience, the gay experience, the Jewish. But to say Arthur Miller was a Jewish playwright would right. be redundant, or August Wilson was an African-American. I think there was part of that. And also Edward did, for all his rebellion, came up from upper crust. Exactly. I, my favorite picture of Edward I don't know where it is. It's him driving his own pony cart. <laughs> As a little and this is someone I was living with who was, you know, delivering telegrams until <laughs> Zoo Story. At their house in Palm Beach was next door to the Kennedys. They had their own railroad car. Oh so God. when they went to Palm Beach once a year, they would have the same cook and made, you know, the help. They, they took the staff. With them, he was adopted, but the parents were rich. So Edward, his grandfather had been the Keith Albee. Circuit. Edward knew this world, the Bohemian world that I inhabited more naturally. I had no money, and most of our friends didn't. Was more the thing he had to learn. But you were with him during Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Yeah. Right? Do you remember him writing it? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, what, what did you read pieces of it? Did you yeah. Oh yeah, and we'd look at each other's work. And, and did you think comment. brilliant, or did you thought I don't know what this is? No, I thought, but I also did. I thought. The new story was the most brilliant play. Uh, in many ways, it's still my favorite. It's the most astonishing writing. Uh, but the voice was so major and specific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just said, who is this? And uh, you know, most of the time you see a play by a new playwright and you say, that's very nice or talented. Yeah. But so often you go, so seldom do you go, wow, that's a voice I never heard before. And that happened with the zoo story. So Virginia Woolf was a logical, I think where Edward's work significantly starts changing, which was with his next play, uh, Tiny Alice, mm -hmm. which got very mystical and... Yeah, we'll uh, get, to, the, yeah, we'll get but, to that in a minute. Mercedes, I want to ask you, when you did um, The Goat, or Who Was Sylvia, bizarre idea for a play. Uh, a man comes home and says to his wife, you're the wife, I'm in love with a goat, mm. really a goat. Mm. What did you think when you get this script to read? Well, I loved the character. That's the first thing. You know, do I fall in love with this son. character or not? And I did. I've been, I've been, well, happy, I guess that's the word. No, I don't guess, I know, I've been happy. But I had done Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And I had done a lot of work on the play about the baby because I read, read for it. And I, I mean, at the center of uh, most of Edward's plays is an enigma. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it is, it, it's, it's the driving center of the play, whether it's the baby or the goat or in Delicate Balance, the terror, mm -hmm. you know? And um, Edward would never answer any questions about how to interpret 
that particular figure. So uh, I soon discovered that whatever I decided the goat was for me, um, no matter how outré, <laughs> I was not going to share it with anybody, including him. <laughs> and so I never did. And I never will. <laughs> but I, I, uh, fair is fair. He wouldn't tell you what he thought it was, so you don't have to tell him, right? <laughs> it's not something that you can communicate to someone else or need to. Best not communicated for the actors who work on that play. Best kept a secret because if you can try to communicate it at all, people will watch you trying to perform your secret. Right. And that doesn't work at all. And um, I respect him for it. And I respect him for leaving me alone and the other actors alone to figure out what and who the goat was. He expected a lot of you in that regard. And it was, it was a pleasure to reach up and try to deliver. What kind of notes would he give you as an actor? They were very brief. We got a lot of notes from the director, of course. Yeah. And um, some, some would be filtered in through um, uh, the producer. But, but largely, he, he left it alone. He, w he rarely changed a line from the first reading, rarely. And the only notes that I remember getting from him in any of the productions I did were about uh, letting anything drop into sentimentality. Mm. He was allergic to it in, in, a, in a passionate way. Mm. Sentimentality. And I'd always heard from actors, too, he was very particular about the, the words and the language. Mm -hmm. Every word he wrote had to be said, could not be taken out, could not be added to. Because... He used to say to us on this show, he thought, sort of thought of himself as a musician when he was writing. Like a composer. Yes, exactly. And I wrote a rest here. I wrote a, a comma. A composer, you wouldn't change his notes, but some actors ad lib slightly. A word even would run. It would crazy. Mm. He was very precise in his punctuation. And what made me think of what you were just saying, I'm sure you heard this many times, people always saying, that, what is the play about? And he'd go, about two hours. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, he said that many times. He, he had those yep. laugh lines, a way of deflecting. But he did not like to be asked what his play was about. Well, yeah. I don't yeah. think many playwrights do. Jacob, was he, I'd always heard he was working on a play at the end of his life, something about an egg. What was it called? Laying an egg. Laying an egg, yeah. which I love. I love the title, laying an egg. Yeah. How far along did he get into it? Is there a draft of it? Is there something? Not a full draft. No. Is there enough there that you can do something with it? Some. I point? don't think so. No. I think he realized while writing that play that he wasn't going to finish it, mm. and I think that you know, that's that's uh, the probably the best and most that can be said about it. In in, in not so many words, he uh, intimated to me. Uh, I'm not finishing this play. Terrence, uh, uh, he was open, uh, at least here on this show, and in the very good book that Mel Gusso wrote about him, about his um, alcoholism, mm -hmm. which was a very big part of his life and to a, mm -hmm. up to a point where he stopped drinking. You were with him during that time. Uh, was, it, was it really out of control at, at any point, his drinking in his, in, his, in his early part of his life? Well, I'm a hard one to... Um, to answer that question, it's the pot calling the little oh. black, we both would. But we didn't think of ourselves as alcoholics. We just liked to drink a lot and party and, you know, it was fun. When you're young, you don't have concepts like alcoholism. Yeah. I'm glad Edward stopped drinking. He would not, he would not have lived to have written The Goat, yeah. for example, or the play about the baby. By the time they did um, Oh John Gilgood's All Over Edward Albee, people used to laugh at that. Edward's famous possessive billing, but Edward Albee's all over John. John Gielgud. Oh, that's right. That's all you can read. That's right. That looking down 40 history. Uh, that's about the time when I think everybody was, who cared about Edward, even just professionally, uh, was alarmed. And uh, that's when he, you know, took action. And then he stopped drinking. He, really, he stopped fairly yep, quickly. He did it the, you know, what do you call it, white knuckles way. Yeah. He had uh, no use for AA uh, really, or, or psychiatry. Edward was an odd duck. He didn't think of himself as an alcoholic. You know, there was a big, there's a big difference between going to an AA meeting and saying, my name is Edward, I'm an alcoholic, yeah, yeah. and I drink too much. Edward would say, yes, I drink too much. Yeah. But somebody, I think uh, his last partner, Jonathan, yeah, yeah. Uh, was, uh, 
I think probably it came down to it, it's me or the the booze. And Edward stopped, and mm. uh, everyone was glad he did. He was not. He was not a good drunk. He he got quite nasty and cruel to people people he loved too, people he respected, who just would get out of control. There's a heartbreaking moment in Mel's book things. in Mel's book where Edward had gone to a party that Joe Papp had, and got drunk and insulted everybody. And he wrote a letter to Joe the next day that Mel quotes in the book where he apologizes mm. for his behavior. And he, he says, uh, they say, um, in vino veritas. And he says, there's no veritas in vino for me. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was very, very moving. But there's another side of him too. There was a playful, wonderful, loving, caring side. You must have seen that as you got closer. I to have a picture from Easter Sunday. We were doing the goat. And we had a, um, a staff, you know, the stage manager and his staff, and they staged an Easter egg hunt before the show. And so we all arrived early, and Jonathan and Edward came, and we were all given baskets, and Easter eggs were hidden all over backstage, all over the dressing rooms. And I have a picture of my son, who was at that time four years old, and Edward spotting the same egg at the same time, with the same, I'm going to get it first, look <laughs> on their faces. There was a child in him. He loved things like that. But I wanted to say that there is a word that he uses for art that he really likes, and it's tough. If he calls a work of art tough, that means it's got weight, it's got value, it's, it's got that thing. And he felt that way about performances, and his plays were tough. For actors, they were tough, yeah. and he was tough in not giving you any help or giving you easy bromide, uh, nothing, nothing. You didn't get much at all. Encouragement and, and, and admiration and, uh, when, in his gruff way when you did the work the way he wanted, the music the way he wanted to hear it. But I, I, I'm not surprised at all that he wouldn't even think of going to AA. He did everything alone. He did everything the tough way. Hmm. I remember getting, for a while, I, I would get Christmas morning calls from yeah. him. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess he would, it was so touching. I'd pick up the phone and it would be, Edward, <laughs> Merry Christmas, you know. Yeah. And <laughs> I remember one of the last Christmas calls I got was the day his good friend, Joanna Steichen, very, very close friend, had died a month or two before. And he said that morning he had just come back from the beach, um, putting her ashes in the Atlantic as she had requested. And I thought, what, what a lonely Christmas morning. But I thought many times he had a talent for solitude. Mm -hmm. he, 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 he was not afraid of pure loneliness. In fact, I think in that condition, he did some of his greatest work. Mm -hmm. I do remember, now you say that, well, he told me he'd gone to Easter Island, mm -hmm. and he was thinking about writing a play. I think, that, I think that might have, that in his mind might have been his last play, that he would have chosen to write that as his last play. Easter Island, yes. It would have been titled Silence. Yes, because he said to me, he said, the thing that most impressed me about Easter Island was the silence. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm, fascinating, man. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jacob, you're now in charge of the Edward Albee estate. Uh, Edward Albee Foundation. Foundation, right. And does that mean also you curate the plays, you look after the plays too? Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of everything, uh, and I think that this is such early days of a transition that um, all of the roles are being worked out. Mm -hmm. But as far as what I do in terms of running the foundation, we'll just keep doing uh, all the good work of, that, that Edward uh, uh, wanted, which is to help young writers and artists. Right. Ed Jacob, you're organizing a, a memorial for Edward in December at a theater to be announced. Yeah, some, sometime soon after Thanksgiving. It'll be open to the public. I believe so. Right. And Terrence, the last time you saw Edward? Exactly two weeks before he died. Out in Montauk? Out in Montauk, yeah. I, uh, my husband, Tom Curdy, and I went out for lunch, and we ended up staying almost two hours. Where most of our visits last summer were about an hour. But he had more energy, and he was more verbal than he'd been in years. And uh, we had a wonderful visit. When I left, I certainly didn't think that's the last time I've seen Edward. Uh, but I also wasn't shocked when I was told he had had passed because he was he was sick, uh, you know. And uh, any fear of death at all? Did he talk about? No, that? no. He said he wasn't. We talked about it. 
because I'm terrified of it. And uh, he wasn't. He said he wasn't. I, I hope that's true. But, um, but he was. I think he was aware that he was never going to be quote well again. Right. Right. Uh, well, I mean, he'll always be with us because the, the, the work <laughs> will we'll never leave and us. And actors like you. We'll yeah, yeah. And then there'll be generations of people discovering these plays. Because I, too, like you, like you, I had not heard of him before. I had an audition for a class he was teaching. I thought I'd better read one of this guy's plays. I went to the library. I picked Who's Afraid of Junior Wolf off the shelf, sat in the book stalls and read it from start to finish. Mm. Amazing. Um, all right. Uh, uh, Jacob Holder, who is the executive director of the Edward Albee Foundation. Thank you for thank joining you. us on Theater Talk. The great actress Mercedes Rule. I'm sure there are a few more Edward Albee roles you have in mind that you'd like to play. Anything? You better. Okay. <laughs> and great playwright himself, Terrence McNally, a good friend of Edward Albee. Thank you very much for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Thank you. I've been proud of everything you've done. I've been happy with our funny son. I've been, I've been well, happy, I guess that's the word. No, I don't guess, I know, I've been happy. Look at me, mother, I married the man I love and I've been so happy. Oh, Stevie. Oh, get your <laughs> hands, off <laughs> hands off of me. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.